Um, I'll introduce Dr. Donata Henry, who will introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joelle. Dr. Peter Kappas is an applied conservation biologist with over 20 years of research experience. His PhD work focused on understanding basic life history strategies of Adelie penguins, but most of his research focuses on monitoring and developing tools to help conserve at-risk species and ecosystems, particularly invasive predators on oceanic islands. He recently joined Mississippi State University's research staff at the Coastal Research and Extension Center in Biloxi, where he is managing the Alabama and Mississippi components of the NOAA Restore Firebird Project, which seeks to understand how to use prescribed fire to benefit black rails, yellow rails, and mottled ducks along the northern Gulf of Mexico. And our conversation so far has been so fascinating. I'm just really looking forward to this talk, and I know you're all going to enjoy it. So thank you, Peter. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself there. Thank you very much, Donata, for that. And thank you all for having me here and coming out and um, listening to my, my talk. Um, basically, I just want to give you a little, little heads up here on where we're going to be heading today for the talk. Um, this will work. There we go. Um, and I'm going to go light on the science here. I think most folks are really just fascinated about uh, Antarctica and the animals and the scenery and the history there. And so I'm going to focus a lot on that and kind of what it's like to do research down there, living in the field, um, show you some of these study sites that I was fortunate to go and visit, um, which often overlap a lot with um, the heroic age exploration of Antarctica. And obviously, I will give you some background on Adelie Penguins too, and uh, the research project team that I was part of, which is Penguin Science. Um, and then for those of you, I, that probably will take about an hour, And but it, I know a lot of the folks here are obviously interested in birds. Um, the avifauna community is not very diverse uh, in the Ross Sea that far south. You're basically at the furthest extent of open water on the planet. Um, so there's only a few species that are regularly occur there. But I also was fortunate to do research on the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which basically you jump off from Chile or Argentina and go across the Drake Passage. And so there's a lot more uh, birds there. So if you want to stick around or uh, find that interesting, I can just show you more pictures of, of a lot more bird species that uh, call this area home. So I did my PhD at Oregon State. So that meant that we had to fly from Corvallis down to um, New Zealand, which is the jumping off point to go down to McMurdo Station. And, and you go to the Clothing Distribution Center, that's CDC. That's not the Center for Disease Control. Um, and basically everyone who goes down to Antarctica through the National Science Foundation, which is, I'll refer to that as NSF throughout this talk, um, has to go through this. We all get our flu shots. I'm guessing now with COVID, there'll be all sorts of uh, COVID related things to get into New Zealand and then probably even more stringently to get you out down to the ice. Um, but they just, Everything is very tight and communicable diseases are spread rapidly there. So they don't like anybody who doesn't have their flu shot or is looking like they have it symptomatic of anything to get on one of the planes down. And you basically are outfitted with, um, can you see my, my mouse here? Okay, you're outfitted with basically all of this gear is provided to you. Um, you. Some of it is mandatory to take and some of it you can opt in or out of and substitute with your own gear. Um, but you basically come in and spend a whole day with about, you know, depending on however many other people are going down at that time, sometimes it can be, you know, a handful of people and sometimes it can be a hundred or more. And everybody is trying on, they put out all the clothes here and you're trying on your sizes and putting everything on and taking it off. And then everybody has these labeled bags with their names and numbers on them that they put all their gear in. And then it gets all lined up and you are ready the next day in theory to head off to Antarctica, um, which remember this is the austral summer, so it's really usually very warm in Christchurch, but you're flying to Antarctica, and so you have to wear, <laughs> in theory, all this gear, even though it's summertime there. Um, and so we wait in the airport and we get the okay to go on the plane south, 
And then um, often though, the weather is so bad in Antarctica that you don't get the okay. And so you wait for hours and hours and then they finally say the flight's canceled. And this can go on from anywhere from one day to weeks. Sometimes I've had colleagues that spent two and a half weeks in Christchurch just waiting for the weather to clear to get on a flight down there. And I've heard horror stories of people who got on a flight, went down there, turned around, didn't land and came back. And that is a six hour flight one way. Um, so it can be really, from a scientific standpoint of doing research, it can be, that turns a lot of folks off because that's a lot of time and energy invested and you're not necessarily collecting data during that time. Um, but usually, eventually, the weather clears and you do get to go out to the tarmac, you load up on the plane, and you head out to Antarctica, which is much further south from New Zealand, and you fly into McMurdo Station, which is on Ross Island, and I'll show you a pan out eventually and we'll get a better look at it. But this is what it looks like. You can see it's a fairly large installation. Um, and once you get there, you land on the, you know, sorry, once you're in the air, this is what it can look like. Sometimes it's just all seats and rows like this of people, but often it's particularly early in the season or late in the season, you're transporting gear as well. So you can be in there with helicopters, you can be in there with trucks, you can be in there with big propellers, whatever it is. And um, they're really great because once they get up, they let you come up here and go up into the cockpit and look out the windows and see everything that um, everybody's fascinated to see because most people haven't been there before. And most of the way down, you're looking out at sea ice. Um, and then eventually you come and you get your first sight of the, the mainland uh, of the continent there, which is the Royal Society range. You land on the sea ice and um, often it is howling and miserable right away, but we were very fortunate on the day we got there. It was beautiful and sunny and calm and you we were just like, this is everything I thought it would be. And you get in one of these big vans here or this weird contraption and everybody gets taken into town. Um, this is a U.S. base, but many countries piggyback off of the NSF U.S. base. There's three main bases in Antarctica that the U.S. Uh, operate. This McMurdo is the largest, and then there's the South Pole, and then there's the Palmer Station, which is over on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. Um, but they will all often piggyback on us and use our infrastructure and our resources to get them to their remote field camps, or they will do science with us uh, in, in our camps and our stations and whatnot. So there's this big welcome with all these different flags that represent the different nationalities that are there doing research. Everybody gets their welcome packets, their keys to their room. And if you're going into the deep field, which is by helicopter or fixed wing aircraft, then you often have to take a bunch of trainings before they let you go um, into the field. Or um, if you're gonna be doing particular types of research or operating snowmobiles and things like that, you have to get all these certifications before you're okayed. Um, and, but this is kind of like what, what it looks like. This is looking out over McMurdo Sound here. This is the dry valleys, which you may have heard of where it's all pretty much dry and doesn't really have any ice or snow in it. Um, and this is looking down onto McMurdo, the whole station. Uh, there's bars there in the height of summertime. I think they can get up to around 5,000 people there. Um, so it really becomes a little city. Um, and um, this is just kind of looking back from the Discovery Hut. This is the Discovery Hut. This was the main hut for Scott's um, discovery expedition and they used it off and on also when they went down to the attempt for the South Pole. They had another one up at Cape Evans and eventually Shackleton put another one further up uh, at Cape Royds, which I'll talk about later on. Unfortunately, when I was there, I, they have tours and everything. I just never overlapped when it was open to go into this particular hut, but this is looking back at the station and this often this ice here will blow out and this is where the Coast Guard will come in to resupply everything. One of the things that you have to do if you're going out to the deep field is go to happy camp. And that's basically you spend uh, 24 hours out on the ice 
and you learn how to make um, a snow cave, how to put up structures if you were stuck in the field for some reason without any support, um, cooking, putting up Scott tents, how to navigate in whiteout conditions and all that sort of safety, basic safety survival, and um, learning how to be careful with white gas at these low temperatures, which can be super dangerous. Um, and then you spend the night, you can either choose to spend it in the Scott tent or you can dig your own snow cave and you spend the night in that. And it actually is quite warm because um, once you get out of the wind, it's not that bad. Um, and you just pull this piece over and you're all snug as a bug in a rug there. Um, and this is just overlooking all of this is Mount Erebus which is one of the world's most active volcanoes. You can see it smoking here. So there's all sorts of research that's happening there. There are volcanists, there's geologists, there's biologists, there's marine biologists, there's atmosphere and weather. There's just so much stuff going on. Um, so it's really interesting and a vibrant community with people who have just doing the most interesting things. And then all the support staff also are really interesting people. All the people who operate the trucks and make sure that the sewage gets taken care of, they all have very unique lives and go and live and do these crazy adventures. And so when you're at the main base, they have these seminars um, and they have all these programs where you just are immersed in all these people who are doing really interesting things either on the ice and in their other lives when they go back uh, during the other seasons. So it's a really fascinating place to be. Um, this is a, a recreating whiteout conditions of what it's like to go to the bathroom in whiteout conditions and how do you find somebody who's lost and uh, all sorts of other safety types of um, considerations that are potentially in play when you get out into the field there. And this just kind of gives you a scope of the, the, the types of vistas you get regularly in Antarctica. This is Mount Erebus. This is the far end of Ross Island. This is Mount Terror. These are over 10,000 feet tall. Um, and in the, I'll talk about this in a little bit here about the worst journey in the world. Those guys basically walked from here over at McMurdo all the way past this mountain out here to get these emperor penguin eggs in the middle of winter time in the dark. Um, so it, it's a pretty amazing place. So we didn't do that. We were fortunate to get on our helicopter and it would take us, and I'll see if I can pause this here so you can. So this is Ross Island. Um, so we basically would fly in a helicopter out here to Cape Crozier and they did this walk sledging. I think it was three of them in the middle of winter time. Um, it's absolutely Cherry Gerard. Um, the, the premise of their expedition at that point was, I'm not sure if you, you, some of you may be familiar with this phrase, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And that's basically, it was a historical hypothesis that was um, sort of the development of the embryo of an animal from fertilization to its um, gestation or attaching goes through the stages that resemble um, the success of adult stages and the evolution of that animal's history of their phylogeny. So they thought that this was going to be this revolutionary breakthrough if they could get these different eggs from these emperor penguins that they could kind of show graphically the evolution. Obviously that turned out to be wrong, but those guys risked their lives to get these emperor penguins, uh, emperor penguin eggs. And even my the main PI on my project, Dr. David Ainley, um, he's been going down there since the late 60s was his PhD. So in my PhD, I cited some of his early papers, which were from 1972, which was when I was born. And he still goes to the ice. He's still going down to Cape Royds. And some of his early years, they literally walked behind a bulldozer out to Cape Crozier. Um, and it skied and walked and snowshoed their way there. Uh, so getting on a helicopter is much, much easier <laughs> to do. Um, but then you would go, I flew out to Cape Crozier. On the way there, you get some more beautiful scenery, um, looking at Mount Erebus, a lot of the crevasses in the glaciers. Um, this is one of our colleagues, Annie, who I worked with while I was down there. Um, and then you land, and this is our field 
location here at Cape Crozier. Uh, we basically have these Scott tents. These are really pretty much the same technology as 100 years ago when Scott and Shackleton and everybody was on the ice. They're good up to about 120 miles an hour, which is better than the modern day mountaineering tents, which usually tend to break and snap at about 100 miles an hour. Um, so most people prefer to be in these. And then we have this basically, it's a converted shipping container basically. Um, and that's our safety shelter. If the weather gets really hairy, um, we would get in here and sleep in here, but that had our kitchen and all of our supplies in it. And then we had a toilet. Everything gets put into all waste and everything gets put in these drums and everything is taken off the continent. There is leave no trace is now um, the operating um, standard there. And remember it's daylight, 24 hours a day. This is what nighttime looks like. This is about probably two o'clock in the morning. So that's about as dark as it, as it ever got the entire time we were there. Um, this is what the inside of the tent looks like. This is about as dark as it would ever get for you to sleep in. And another nighttime shot. This is what the inside of the hut looks like. We basically had a stove over here, a little cooking station. This opens up into like a pantry, which is just, that's where we stored everything that would stay frozen. Um, There's no refrigeration or freezer or anything like that. And you just go out and you chip ice and snow from this for your drinking water and melt it. Um, and that's, you spend a lot of time tightening your guy wires and fixing and printing your, your tent, because if you don't, the wind will knock it down. Um, and you know, it's bad. I got put in a, in the, the new person section, the winds come from right behind, right around this. And you would basically, you knew it was bad once rocks started flying by you. You were like, you should probably go into the shelter at that point in time. Um, that only happened a couple of times, so that was good to not have that happen regularly. But this is it where absolutely uh, Cherry Gerard and his colleagues ended up. The, they had thought initially that they would just build igloo-like structures for their structure when they would go out and get these emperor penguin eggs. Uh, it turned out that they miscalculated the reason that the penguins are there is this is one of the windiest places on the planet. It regularly gets 80 knot winds. It gets these catabatic winds that come down from the pole. Basically the pole's at 10,000 feet and that super cold air rushes down the entire continent 10,000 feet. And when it gets out here, it's going 80 to 100 miles an hour and it sweeps all the snow away. And that creates this area where the Adelie penguins really like to be because it's free of any ice and snow. And there are all these little pebbles that they can build their nest with. Um, what that doesn't mean though, is you can't build penguin, you can't build igloos and things like that when you get out there. So those poor guys in the middle of winter in these huge storms are trying to build this rock shelter that still is there. And you can still see the ropes, the original ropes. You can see socks and there's canvas there from their tent um, that they spent like, uh, I think a week or more there trying to get these eggs. Um, and they successfully did, and they brought them back. And if you ever have an opportunity to read, um, put it up here, The Worst Journey in the World, it's a fascinating read. It's all about that journey, but it's also about Scott's expedition, failed expedition to the pole. And I think what people don't realize is Admundsen and the Norwegians, they just went down and they went to the pole and they came back and they were successful. The Brits, were doing science. They were collecting rocks, they were taking samples, they went out of their way to get to open areas to collect specimens of various things. And so it's really amazing that they weren't just exploring. The whole time they were doing all sorts of different aspects of science. And so it's, um, it's really an interesting um, place to see and, and to think that they were doing this under the conditions that they were. Um, this is the colony. This is Cape Crozier. This was the largest colony in the world until they just found um, Inaccessible Island on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. All the Adelie penguins have been disappearing on that on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. They weren't sure where they were going and they've moved, it looks like, to this island, Inaccessible Island, that is inaccessible and very difficult to get. They actually found it with satellites 
And now they think that that might be the largest colony in the world. But this is, I think now it's up to around five, a half a million pairs. So almost a million birds, a little bit more, plus or minus. And you can see here, these are my colleagues here, surrounded by a sea of penguins. And it stretches for kilometers inland and kilometers along the waterfront too. Um, a really stunning place. This is all penguins, all this little white all the way up here. This is the fast ice right here on the shoreline and Mount Terror up here. And this is what it looks like when you look out onto the ice. This is the Ross ice shelf here. And then this is fast ice. This back here is an emperor penguin colony. Um, and then this is penguins going to and from the colony. This is over here, I don't know if I have any pictures that show up, but just basically over here, the shelf ends and there's an open water pollinia that's there. That's those catabatic winds basically prevent ice from ever forming there. And that's part of the reason that this is such a huge colony because they have regular access to open water and food resources. But in order to get out there, you have to navigate through these tidal cracks and everything that are often patrolled by leopard seals. And that's why everybody's all waiting here for the first person to jump into the water. And then everybody mad dashes to not get eaten by the leopard seals and vice versa coming back. So if you're here, that's a regular part of your life history strategies. Um, if you're breeding early in your life, you're gonna have to do this a lot more than if you maybe wait a, a couple of years later, but you only live for X number of years. Um, so those are some of the questions, types of questions that I was looking at for my PhD. In addition to that, you get all these crazy um, cloud features, lots of lenticular clouds over Mount Terror. This is the first time I've ever seen Humboldt's clouds. I'd heard about them, but kind of like the green flash didn't think it existed. And then I saw them. This is basically the cloud is growing vertically, but there's a wind shear that is pushing it over and it forms these wave-like features. Um, so you get to see just some amazing things. And then this here is highlights kind of that interplay of science and history and stunning scenery. You know, you're walking around the penguin colony, you come across the stick and you're like, oh, some, that must have been from Grant or some of the other guys the year before or something. It's like, no, this is from 100 years ago during the Discovery Expedition. This was called Telegraph Hill. And they had multiple ships on that expedition, and they would basically leave mail for the other ships down here, and they could sight this, uh, this um, mountain in the background, and then they would come ashore and they would find this post there. It is now a National Historic Monument. This thing is over 100 years old. It's the same original piece of wood. It's very weird to see any wood here because everything is rock or ice or snow. Um, so that is just a weird color. It's a weird everything. And you're just walking around here looking for bands on penguins. And you're like, how did I get here? Um, you know, one of, the, one of the most powerful experiences I think I've ever had was coming up onto this and realizing like Cape Crozier is often featured in lots of documentaries, Nat Geo or BBC, Frozen Earth. And this is where it happens. And it was like, I'm here not as a tourist and not as like a guest. I'm here because this is my research and I worked really hard to get here. And I'm one of these people that you hear and see. And you're, you know, I remember growing up and watching, like, I want to do that someday. And it was just really validating to, to have that moment. And I kind of had this outer body experience looking down. I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like, this is crazy that people get to do this for a living. And I wish that more people could see these places and see these things, because I think we would value them a lot more um, if people could see them, but they're also really hard and dangerous to get to. So um, after spending a couple of, like about a month and a half to two months at Cape Crozier, I then had the luxury of flying over to Cape Roids. Um, Let's see if I can pause this here before. So McMurdo's just down here. I flew from here over to Cape Royds, but often early in the season, we'll basically, the weather is still pretty gnarly and sometimes the, this isn't all set up and open. So we would just take snowmobiles out onto the ice and, and commute back and forth. Um, and so 
this is where Shackleton's hut is, and this pin is basically right on top of Shackleton's hut. Thank you, Google Earth. It's uncanny. You can even see tents from our things on Google Earth if you look at these places. It's pretty amazing. And this is what it looks like when you're out on the McMurdo ice shelf on the snowmobiles, solid ice. Occasionally, you'll um, get find snow ice caves in the glaciers and sometimes even in some of the uh, icebergs that may get entrapped in the ice. And so you can go in and explore them and they're super amazing and beautiful. Um, and then this is Cape Crozier. You've just come from a half, a, uh, like a million birds, and this is about 3,000 pairs. So a much, much smaller colony with lots of different dynamics of what's happening there. And this is actually David Ainley, Dr. David Ainley out there um, citing bands. This is our current um, living conditions, our hut. And this was the Cape Royds hut for Shackleton's group. This is still the original food. There's still stew, Irish stew in there. They found a bottle of scotch under there. Um, the Kiwis are restoring it right now. That's what all this is. And they went back to the original distiller and they now do make that same formula of the scotch that they found from the, the expedition for Shackleton. So you can find that at your, maybe at your local liquor store. Um, we were really fortunate while I was there, the head of NSF came out. So when the VIPs come out, they open everything up and they do the tour. And it looks exactly like when they left it, pretty much. This is the inside. There's the clothes, the bargains that they had, Ernest Shackleton's signature on some of the shipping goods. And so it's just really amazing. You can still see the dog huts. They're much smaller dogs than our dogs 100 years later that they used. Um, they just got rid of all the dogs on the continent uh, about 10 years ago. So there are none there anymore, but they had, used to have them um, there even fairly recently. And it was really interesting because um, they didn't have Leave No Trace. And so now you can't move this, even though this is garbage, you're not allowed to take any of this and remove it because it's historical. And so it's just as interesting that like we would, you're not supposed to leave any of our stuff, but like they were okay to leave their stuff. Now this is like history and our stuff is garbage. Um, but one of the interesting things that the NSF director was saying of, was a research project that actually didn't get funded. They, the, this is the toilet. There's still good toilet specimens there. And somebody had done a proposal to look at what the, fauna was like and the flora was like before there were antibiotics. And you could do it here because they're in perfect condition still and there are no antibiotics. It's, she said it ended up not getting funded, but you're like, this is crazy. You could still really, like that was a legitimate NSF proposal. Um, and then this is uh, a webcam that we have for our project that goes out on the Cape Roids. We have a whole um, outreach component where we interact with uh, elementary students and they have a biology section that's all about penguins and they all make flags for us and we fly them. Um, and we change them out through the course of the season and anyone that gets fl flown, we all sign it and send it back to them and they can see it on the webcam the day that it's being flown for them. Um, so it's really a great outreach tool. And then from Cape, after spending about a week at Cape Royds, I went up to Cape Bird, and this is our collaborators with the Kiwis. This is a, a New Zealand base. Uh, Scott base is just south of McMurdo base. And so um, we would come up here and stay at this hut. And this is the tent that I was talking about that you can see on Google Earth, which is still just blows me away. Um, and these, these are little sub colonies of penguins here you can, see them from space. Um, and I was talking with some of you before we started that things are changing and now that we're getting snow more regularly, which is not a normal feature for here. Um, and this is what it looks on one of those snow days, the stairs going up to our hut. This is where we stored gas and things like that. And this is a really swank hut. They had like a heater in it and they have bunks and stuff like that. And so you'd come up here and you'd eat your breakfast and look out onto McMurdo Sound and down at the penguins. And you could even read, if you had a scope, you could read bands <laughs> from the comfort of your, of your hut and eat toasty sandwiches, which the Kiwis were, were very big on toasty sandwiches. 
Um, but this is looking out onto the sound, the main colonies back around this corner here. Uh, this is what the inside of the hut looks like. Um, interesting story. This particular area is not protected in any way, shape, or form. So anybody who got down there on a boat could come ashore and walk around. And in fact, there was a tourist boat that did, and the Kiwis came home one day and there were people in here taking stuff. Like, I, I don't know, they just thought it was like an old historic hut or something. I don't know, but they were literally taking their gear and things like as souvenirs. And they're like, no, this is, this is, we live here, what are you doing? Um, but this is kind of what it looks like um, here. And this is Christmas dinner down there. And so in addition to Adelis, there are a few other cast of characters that are regular um, parts of your day and none more than the South Polar Skua, which think a cross between a hawk and a gull, super aggressive, very, very smart and very intolerant of you doing research on them. Um, in fact, my, I'm, I'll talk about the brown skuas on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. They're a little bit bigger than these guys, but they're so smart that they would take their bands, if you banded them, and they would fly down and they would hit scientists with the bands, the metal bands. So you're getting hit by like this bird at 30, 40 miles an hour with a metal band and they would give people cuts and stitches and things like that. So you have to be really respectful. Um, they often do not bother non-biologists. If you haven't messed with them, they don't mess with you as long as you don't get too close to their nest. But if you have ever um, interacted with them in a negative way, they remember you specifically and will come and be very aggressive to you. Um, and they are obviously very aggressive to the penguins. They, this is a penguin chick that they pulled out and they are a super good flyer. So if a penguin gets up and stretches, they can come on the wing and steal chicks right from underneath penguins um, and definitely do that fairly regularly. Other ones at Cape Crozier are emperor penguins. It's really interesting to see the different personalities. Uh, Adeli penguins are very aggressive. They're very loud. They're constantly fighting their colonies. It's just pandemonium at all times, 24 hours a day, um, because everybody's fighting for these pebbles and maintaining their territories. As you know, from March of the Penguins, emperor penguins are incubating their eggs on their feet. And so they all are very cooperative, very laid back. You go into this colony, it's very quiet. It's very chill. Everybody's polite and nice. And then you get these little little Napoleon complex Adelie penguins come in and just try to beat up everybody and pick fights and it's really interesting to watch um, and it's funny this is so this is an Adelie coming in trying to size up these emperor penguins this chick is as big as he is but that doesn't really matter to a, a, an Adelie jacked up on testosterone they'll take on anything and sometimes you'll see these emperor penguins will make a mistake and wander up into the Adelie colony and you can almost just see it on their face, like what is wrong with these little birds? They're so mean and so angry. And then they like try to get out and they can't because every time you move, they come and attack you. Um, so it just is really interesting to see the differences between the different birds. Um, often early in the season, particularly, you'll see a lot of snow petrels, a gorgeous bird that like is just kind of in the background. And, um, we occasionally would see Wilson's storm petrels and we would see Antarctic petrels, but that was, that's about it. That's all you're going to see for birds for the whole time. Uh, you do have the um, furthest south permanent inhabitant in the world, mammal inhabitant in the world, the Weddell seal. These animals live basically as long as they have teeth because in the wintertime they basically gnaw their way through the ice and that's their breathing hole. And once their teeth are gone, then they can't do that anymore. So if they can manage to stay away from the orcas and everything else, that's usually their limiting factor. Um, and they're all around. Occasionally we would see something like a crab eater seal. They're usually more out on the ice, um, particularly at Cape Crozier, we'd see leopard seals. This is a leopard seal here. Um, and then there's two regular orca subspecies, the type A, the type B, which are larger and are migratory, and they eat penguins and seals and other whales. 
And then there's type C, which is a smaller sort of permanent resident. They come in and out as the ice dictates and they mostly eat fish and krill. Um, and that's pretty much it. There are occasionally you would see uh, minke whales as well. And depending on where you would be, particularly if you're over on the other side of the continent on the peninsula, you would see uh, lots of humpback whales as well. So this is the Adelie penguin and the penguin science team. We're basically focusing on a long-term study, mark free capture study of Adelie penguins doing all sorts of um, interesting work on foraging behaviors, uh, population dynamics. I was looking at life history strategies, but we basically um, are focusing on anything related to their, their lifestyle and their populations. And as you can see, they're one of the true species, Antarctic species. They're called pagophilic, which means ice loving. And you can see this is the extent of the ice in the wintertime, and this is their range. So you really don't find Adelie penguins wherever ice is not a permanent or a very persistent regular feature um, of the ecosystem. And the only other bird that's like that is the emperor penguin. All the other penguins basically can tolerate some amount of ice, but they need ice-free periods. And so this is kind of, there's this bell-shaped curve here where if you have too high frequency, heavy ice years and too much ice, that's not good for Adelie penguins. Uh, but if you don't have enough of it, um, it's not good. So there's sort of this sweet spot in the middle. And as you can see, the Ross Sea is kind of, it's been doing really well. The conditions there and the birds have done really well as a result. And so you hear lots of doom and gloom from the Western Antarctic Peninsula. Remember that's at the Northern extreme of their distribution. And this is the southern extreme. And so things are very different in the Ross Sea than they are on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and my work was looking at basically the influence of ice, ice cover and concentration and these mega iceberg events that occur in winter conditions on different life choices that the birds make for when they start breeding and how often they breed over the course of their lifetime. And this gives you a little better layout. We can see the Scott base here. Um, and you can see here iceberg B15. One of the, when I was talking about those mega icebergs, this was the largest iceberg ever recorded. It was the size of Jamaica. It broke off the Ross ice shelf and then it ground, ran aground right here and kind of flipped around. And there's a little island here called Beaufort. And that stopped the gyre. There's the Ross Sea gyre that kind of goes around like this, this big circle. Um, and usually that kind of sucks out most of the ice out of McMurdo Sound and you get open water. But that, because this was blocked off, this all became solid ice. So the Cape Royds birds had to walk close to 80 kilometers to get to open water. Um, and so while that was there, they had basically um, complete reproductive failure until they figured out that they could use the ice cracks in here, the tidal cracks, and they would dive in there. But uh, a bunch of birds moved which is pretty unusual for most seabirds. Like most seabirds, penguins are highly philopatric and they stay close, they come back to the colony where they were born. And that's usually where they end up breeding. Uh, but we got all these movements, which was kind of unusual and hadn't been recorded. And now that it's gone, some of the birds are actually going back to, the, to Cape Royds. So like I said, right now, Royds is about 3,000 pairs. I think now bird is up to 120,000 pairs and this is probably half, uh, half a million pairs. And you can see our long-term trends are all going upwards for most of the colonies, except for Royds has been really bouncing around. And we think that it's kind of at a threshold where if you're too small a colony, the, the skuas can come in and depredate and eat all of your, your young and that's keeping the population suppressed there. And basically the, the main thrust of our study is this long-term dem demographic study where we every year at Bird and Royds, we would band a thousand chicks and at Crozier, we'd band about two to 400 chicks. Um, they get this little metal band. We come down every year, we walk around the colony all day looking for these bands. You read the band number off. If you find them on eggs, you put in a tag so that you can figure out um, and follow that nest and see if they are um, successful in raising a chick here, and then you repeat. And we've been doing that since the mid 90s. Um, and as a result, 
when I finished my PhD, we deployed over 40,000 tags. We've recited 16,000 individuals. Um, and now there are probably around 50,000 tags have been deployed. So it's been a Herculean effort with thousands of man hours um, looking for these tags. Uh, but it was really great because you just walk around this colony looking at penguins all day long, every day. This is pretty much what the inside of a colony looks like. You can see all these beautiful nests with all these little rocks. They steal rocks from one another. They spend all sorts of time gathering rocks. And these poor birds made the sorry choice to put it in this stream, which just doesn't look so bad right now. But by the afternoon, the temperatures will warm up and this will turn into a foot higher, often drowning their chicks or their eggs uh, and or washing away their nest completely. And so it's really important that you get in areas that are a little bit higher um, and a little more sustainable, but it's really changing dramatically. And, um, sometimes at Cape Bird, that colony is several kilometers, sort of small little colonies spaced several kilometers apart. And you'd walk down in the morning and it would be okay, but it'd be really hairy to get back in the afternoons because the water would be so high. And you can really come up and just move one or two rocks here and it can completely change the course of where that water goes from one day to another. Um, so it's amazing. This had been a huge colony with lots of chicks crushing, and it just was eroding away smaller and smaller one day. And then the next day, this stream was basically 500 meters further south, and there was no water here. And it just it's just so dynamic. Um, and that's becoming more and more of an issue every year as it gets warmer and warmer. So with that, that's kind of the gist of that part of the talk here. I just want to acknowledge all the funding that we received. Uh, the NSF particularly is the major funder for the research there. A lot of the support staff with the Antarctic programs and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon and the Coast Guard that support uh, all of our work in the field. So without further ado, I'll move on. So we go from Cape Bird over to the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which you'll see often referred to as the WAP um, and the Drake Passage. So just up north of here is uh, the Strait of Magellan. So a lot of the research there will come out of uh, Punta Arenas or will come out of Ushuaia, Argentina. Punta Arenas is in Chile and they'll come out and come down here. This is Elephant Island. This is the other side component of the Shackleton failed uh, attempt to cross the continent. Um, and then Palmer, uh, the Palmer station is down here on this, on the Palmer Peninsula. And then where my ex-wife and the sites that we were supporting are here, on, I think it's the Prince Edward Islands. Um, but this is, this funnels all those birds here. So the birding here, if you don't get seasick and you ever get fortunate to go there, is really pretty amazing as seabirding goes. Um, I've birded in the middle of the Indian Ocean and spent an entire 12 hour day and saw one bird the entire day. And here you're seeing, you know, hundreds of birds streaming by pretty regularly. And a lot of these birds are really good ship followers. And so that's, I don't know why this is freezing. But the first one that most people are really excited and charismatic um, is the Wandering Albatross. I wanna thank uh, Blair Nicola, who was one of the folks that was on one of the trips with me for these amazing photos. This is before I had enough money to invest in, a, in one of those nice lenses. Um, but this is one of, depending on which species you're talking of the giant albatrosses, these are potentially the largest um, wingspan of any flying bird on the planet. They can go up to 11 feet, um, three meters basically, uh, the largest ones. They're, they're like a Great Dane. If you saw a Great Dane where you're like, oh, no dogs, and then you see a Great Dane, you're like, that's just something totally different. When you see these birds next to all the other albatrosses, they're just order of magnitude larger. And they're really amazing because they can lock their, their wrist in place. And so they don't flap a whole lot they do this dynamic soaring. And so they're gliding off the wave energy and then they'll come up over the wave and then they'll go down the next one. And so they're using the wave energy to go around and um, they will leave their colonies fledged. And some of them don't come back to land for up to four to seven years. 
before they start coming back and trying to form mates um, to, to find a mate and pair. Um, and so they're really amazing birds. They have these really extensive um, plumage patterns on their wings where you can age them. So there's a bunch of different indexes. If you got down there, there's like the Gibson index and the Harrison index that you could age individual birds. And because they're really good ship followers, um, a lot of them often have these oil markings on their necks. You can really pick out individuals and be like, yep, that bird's been with us for four or five days and it just keeps circling the boat. Um, they usually have a much duller uh, pink bill color and they lack the dark edge on their, um, sorry, I wasn't, I was on the wrong computer. Um, you can see here the little oil markings that I've been talking about and you can see how these different, this is an adult bird and this is a young bird and kind of gets wider and wider. Um, and then they don't have any dark edge, cutting edge on their bill, whereas the royal albatrosses do. The southern royal albatross is believed to be the consistently largest albatross on the planet. They can be a little bit over 11 feet in wingspan. Um, and you can also run into northern um, royal albatrosses as well. And the nice thing with northern royals is their wings are all solid black um, and they don't do that sort of aging out. Another species that you see really regularly, particularly as you get closer to the Antarctic front, are Antarctic fulmars, very similar and reminiscent to our northern fulmar up here in the northern hemisphere. Um, we were talking before I started my talk about the various prions. They can, depending on where you are, particularly if you're close to a colony, they can be tens of thousands of them, huge flocks. Um, they are extremely fast and small and a real difficult one to ID in the field on the wing on a ship that's rolling. Um, you're basically looking at tail patterns, um, these facial patterns, differences in size of bills, if you can get that. And you always have to worry about these blue petrels. At least they have this nice white tail dot, bot, dot. That is easy to, uh, to pick them out. And their flight patterns are a little bit different, but like those would stream by sort of similar to like out in the Pacific when you get these sooty shearwater flocks that just kind of, it's like a river of birds that just kind of keeps going for a day. And there's just thousands of birds just streaming by you you can get into some of these flocks where like, it's not like hundreds of thousands, but like there's just a constant stream of four or five birds going by the boat and it just keeps going and going and going. So they're really interesting birds to, to get to look at. <coughs> you have your Wilson storm petrel, um, which I, as I mentioned, you can get those. We saw those down on Ross Island occasionally. And then you have to really be careful to separate your white-bellied and your black-bellied storm petrels. Um, super small, they'll be out in some of the craziest weather. You're just like, I can't believe that a little tiny bird that's as delicate as this is out here. Um, but it seems like the nastier the weather, the more they're just like, sure, bring it. Ubiquitous black-browed albatross. These guys are about a seven-foot wingspan, so they're a smaller bird. Um, they, you'll see them from, you can see them in the Strait of Magellan. If you are in the mainland, they're, they're pretty uh, amazing ship followers. So there are almost always several of those following the ship at any given time. Um, and this is the one you'll see at Steeple Chase um, in Argentina. That big colony is super famous and that's this, this species is the main bird there. Um, you also get these soft, plumage petrels. These are not good ship followers. They often are just off on the distance uh, going from A to B very quickly, but they have this nice collar and this sort of hooded appearance, which is really diagnostic. And, and like petrels, they have their own unique uh, jizz to them that helps you ID them. And then one of my favorite albatrosses, the gray-headed with this beautiful smoky um, hood and this really striking beautiful yellow and red on their bills. And this is an immature one, what they look like. Another one of my favorite albatrosses, is the light mantled sooty. Um, most of the albatrosses do these elaborate dances when they're mating and pairing. Um, and the light mantled, they do a little bit of that, but their main shtick is that they do these aerial displays. 
And so instead of dancing on the ground, they do these dances at, in, the, in the air. And if you're lucky enough to get to one of their colonies and during the breeding season, you'll see them doing these big elaborate um, aerial displays. And they're just this, again, this really beautiful smoky color, um, really striking. And they're, you don't see them all the time. So they're always kind of like a highlight one, but, but they're around enough that you actually would get to see them. You'll pick up your Cape petrels pretty much right away. They got this nice scalloping on their back. Um, called, they're called Cape pigeons. They're kind of plump little birds and they're always fun to have around, great ship followers. And as you get fur closer to Antarctica <clears throat> and ice, you'll pick up Antarctic petrels and they'll mix in these flocks. So you just kind of have to pick out this more solid um, pattern on their wings and back versus this sort of scalloping in there because they're about the same size and shape and they'll mix in these big flocks together. And usually that's like either a really good Antarctic petrel flock or there's one or two Antarctic petrels buried in a very large flock of um, Cape petrels. Of course, you've got your other penguin species. Um, as the gradient goes from ice loving to non ice loving, the this is the most, second most ice loving are the chin strap. They're pretty tolerant of a fair amount of ice, but they don't like it as much as the Adelis. Um, and then if you're lucky enough to get out to like South Georgia and occasionally some on some of the places on the Drake, you can run into these common diving petrels, um, which are very, very difficult to ID on the wing. Um, super small, basically think of a little Nerf football flying with these super hummingbird fast wing beats and they're so crazy because you'll get in these big huge storms and these big seas and they'll just fly directly through the wave they'll just go in one side and out the other side um so it's really they're really amazing but they are not an easy bird <laughs> id on the wing for sure this is the next one of the non-ice loving the gentoo penguin now is moving its range much more into the antarctic peninsula usually you'll see pictures of these with grass in the background and stuff like that because they're the sort of the least um, ice loving of the pygocillid family. And then there's the southern rock hopper penguin and the macaroni penguin. Again, a lot less ice loving. Um, you will see these if you can get out to South Georgia pretty regularly. They're also down uh, around Elephant Island as well. Um, and the easiest way for me is these crests, the macaroni, they meet, they kind of have this more orangey than this lighter yellow. And then the rock hopper, they don't meet. So the M for meeting macaroni, it's a good way to, because often you're seeing them just porpoising in the water. Um, and the other one that you see, particularly if you get out to South Georgia, you'll see these big groups of these king penguins. This is actually from Crozet Island. I've never had the fortune, good fortune to get to South Georgia, maybe someday. This was my first king penguin, a lonely individual at Arktowski Field Station. It's a Polish station next to one of the sites we were resupplying. And it, there's like a bulldozer back here in a dump truck and it was like really ratty looking but it was my life bird so it's special to me um, but you'll see a lot of these and this is on, on Kerguelen Island in the Indian Ocean uh, these are elephant seals here in the background which is what you'll see a lot on the western Antarctic Peninsula too the other two really good ship followers are white chin petrel um, this is about as good a white as you'll see on the white chin petrel. This one's really good, but usually you can't really see that white. Um, they're really good ship followers though. And so you often can get a look at the, the Coleman here on the bill. And that is this same color here, this light sort of tan vanilla versus Westland petrels, which are not very common, but we think they're more common than people realize because I think people aren't necessarily really looking at all the white chin petrels because there's so many of them. Um, but if you see this black tip, that's your kind of key diagnostic out there because they're pretty similar in shape and jizz um, and they both are pretty good ship followers. And then you have your giant petrels. Um, you have your northern giant petrel here uh, with your red on the bill tip and then you have your southern giant petrel that kind of has this more green or flesh colored um, look on it and the southern giant petrel comes in albino and a white morph. The albinos are extremely rare 
Um, and the white morphs are pretty unusual too, but usually you'll see a few of them if you go across the drake. Um, these all are quite ominous looking birds with these big bills. They're super, uh, can be very aggressive to lots of the penguins and they eat um, all sorts of the dead animals. They'll eat like the skin off of the molting elephant seals. Um, and so they can be really aggressive, but to humans, they're very shy and they're very intolerant to disturbances. And so it's kind of funny that you have this really aggro bird and then they're like, no, no, don't bother me. Um, but you definitely respect them a lot because they will vomit their at you and projectile basically stinky oil of rotting flesh and everything at you so you don't want to get too close to them. And then this is the brown school, a little bit bigger than the south polar school. Uh, these are the birds I was telling you that they'll basically go and they'll hit you with the bands on. Um, super smart and just really interesting cool birds. And then the last but not least oddball bird, the snowy sheath bill, you can see. Um, they look so beautiful with this white, um, but they are some of the dirtiest birds I've ever seen. They literally will take something, they like, some of us, one of my colleagues was working and they were throwing bread out and the bird literally took it and walked over and dipped it into the elephant seal wallow, you know, to get all the bajou and eat it. And they just, he said one time he was watching a macaroni penguin and it would jump up on a rock and then it kind of got pulled. It looked like it fell down and then it jumped up and it happened four or five times and he went over to see like what is going on. And literally a sheath bill was pulling a worm out of its butt. And that's what was happening every time it jump up, the sheath bill would pull it out. Um, so that's those are sheath bills. So good bird to see though, because you're not going to see them anywhere other than down there. Um, and then the other main character that you'll see on the Western Antarctic Peninsula is uh, Southern Elephant Seals. These are the largest elephant seals on the planet. These you kind of get an idea of how big this male is for me. They, these are the ones that you see doing the big fighting in the Nat Geo BBC um, documentaries and whatnot. And uh, there's also uh, Antarctic fur seals, which I didn't put a picture in for. They're at a lot of the, they are also around a lot of the penguin colonies, so you'll encounter them as well. And um, if you go through the Strait, the Magellanic Strait, you'll probably see Comerson's dolphins bow riding uh, with your ship and everything like that. And they're a pretty good novelty um, dolphin to get because they're only there around South Georgia and around Kerguelen. So they're, they're not super common, but in those areas, they're pretty common. So you can see these beautiful dolphins. Um, and then you get minke whales, humpbacks, says whales are all pilot whales are all pretty common as well. And those are, those are the main, main players. And that's all I've got for you. So.